There are some places in the galaxy that are so dangerous they can only be explored by drones. Zoramnia is one of those. Everything there wants to kill you, and it's got the claws, the teeth, and the sheer bloody-mindedness to do it. We've taken pictures from orbit, sent down a few probes, but no one actually goes there. Except humans, of course. The EMEA Science Consortium took an interest in Zoramnia because of its unusually competitive biosphere, and conducted several studies looking into how a permanent research base could be established. The original plan was to burn away a small section of the native flora and build a small, fully enclosed city as on Miayin 4 and Kualamia. However, it proved to be very difficult to eradicate the local plants fully. They tended to grow back in as little as two or three days. Sterilizing a prospective site completely meant scouring the soil down to the bedrock. Even then, there were a few species that burrowed their roots so deep they were effectively unkillable and could only be prevented from growing back immediately by setting down a layer of reinforced ceramo steel. And even that wasn't a permanent solution, as the planet's vegetation could rip apart just about any building material if given enough time. The same was true of its animals, which would also rip apart just about anything else as well. Quite a lot of equipment was lost to native wildlife, which burrowed through the walls of the temporary stations parachuted onto the surface, then methodically shredded everything inside looking for anything they could eat. Zoramnia was classified grade 12, extremely hazardous, and surface exploration was written off as impractical, not to mention likely to result in the deaths of anyone taking part. From then on, all our research was conducted from orbit. There's a limit to what you can do with probes, but there's also a limit to what you can do if you're dead. We warned the humans of the dangers Zoramnia presented, but they insisted on sending a survey team anyway. There was an automated rescue craft on standby for when the humans called for help. Humans are known to be resilient and aggressive, but we were still expecting a manned survey mission to end in disaster. However, to our great surprise, they weren't all immediately killed. In fact, they completed their task without suffering a single casualty. Then, the humans sent another expedition, and they weren't killed either. This we found puzzling. Granted, humans were tough. Their native world, Earth, would probably be ranked at least a grade 10 or 11 if they hadn't already wiped out just about all the large predators. But Zoramnia's wildlife should still be lethal even to an adult male human. The largest predators weighed several tons, and even the small ones tended to travel in swarms that could strip down a carcass in minutes. Our technology would allow us to survive on the surface for a limited period, but even EMEA engineering would give way eventually under the relentless biological assault, and human tech was markedly inferior to ours. We were missing something, and being scientists, we were anxious to find out what. Unfortunately, we couldn't just ask the humans to take one of our probes with them, the Science Consortium has very strict rules about what technology can be given to aliens, and since it's largely based on their current tech level, there was basically nothing we could let the humans have. We also didn't want to send one of our probes to follow them around, just in case spying on them was interpreted as an act of aggression. Given the humans' reputation, we all agreed that was a risk that was not worth taking. Which left us only one option, a joint research expedition. Or, to put it another way, we would have to approach the humans and ask them if they were willing to let a couple of us accompany them down to the surface. We could bring some of our equipment with us so long as we were there to supervise it. It would be the only way we'd ever get a first-hand look at Zoramnia, although the science consortium implied that it was also interested in what we could learn about the humans from observing their research methods. It's not a good sign when the easy part of a plan is approaching a species of carnivorous aliens asking to hitch a ride. Still, there would be a huge amount of academic kudos in being the first Amia to set foot on Zoramnia. We drew lots. I'm still not sure if I won or lost, but either way I ended up as the candidate. After I was selected, my esteemed colleagues decided that really, only one of us was needed to supervise the equipment, and there was no sense in risking sending any more of the team down to the planet. Bastards. I thought about backing out, but my career wasn't going to get another chance like this. Even if I didn't get a scrap of data, I'd still have demonstrated my unrivaled commitment to science. Besides, there was always the chance the humans would say no. Then I could have my fruit pudding and eat it too. The humans said yes. Bastards.
In fact, the humans were extremely eager to undertake a joint research expedition. I think they were glad that someone from the wider galactic community was actually taking their scientific efforts seriously. It's always hard being the new species on the block. Of course, we didn't mention the fact that we wanted to study them as much as the Zoramnian wildlife. They did emphasize that while they would take every effort to ensure my safety and their security precautions were rigorous and hadn't failed yet, they couldn't 100% guarantee that I would make it back alive. This was no surprise, of course, but again, I thought about backing out. Did I really value my career enough to risk my neck for it? The answer to that was, no, not really. I really did want a professorship, but not so much that I thought it was worth being ripped apart by the Zamnian wildlife. However, I'm a scientist, damn it. I've always wanted to be a scientist. My whole life's goal is to make a significant contribution to science, and I didn't see myself doing that sitting on an orbital research station going over probe data. As the saying goes, new discoveries hide where researchers fear to look. Of course, that aphorism usually refers to the fear of intellectual nonconformity, breaking from the flock and being ridiculed or ostracized by your scientific peers. But I didn't see any reason it couldn't also apply to the fear of ending up in an alien's digestive tract. The humans made a space for me on their very next expedition, so at least I didn't have too long to ferment in my own terror. I did almost have a panic attack on the shuttle as it was carrying me over to the human ship, but fortunately, I stayed conscious and coherent enough to introduce myself to my new colleagues without making a total embarrassment of it. The humans were actually reasonably pleasant. Well, some of them were. There were 21 humans on the research team, and four of them introduced themselves right away. Doctors Reed, Khalili, Wei, and Bauman. They were very welcoming and seemed anxious to make sure I had everything I needed. The rest were, well... I don't like to say stereotypically human, but they were a bit intimidating. They ignored me completely, going about their duties with brusque efficiency, and I definitely got the impression that it would be safer if I didn't get too close to them. Actually, one of them did introduce herself to me, Grace McKenzie, leader of the expedition. She had a couple of scars on the right side of her face and an augmetic eye. It put me in mind of an old Gia hawk that's been defending its territory for decades. The effect was only enhanced by the hawk-like glint in her remaining eye that pierced through her otherwise expressionless face. She only spoke to me briefly, firstly to welcome me aboard the ship, then to emphasize that I was to follow her directions at all times, and doing otherwise would put my safety at risk. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure if she meant from the native wildlife or from her. Instead of unloading our equipment after we landed, we would ride down in the vehicle we'd use on the surface, which was slung beneath the undercarriage of the shuttle. The vehicle had three segments, a cabin and two trailers. The cabin had two wheels, and the trailers had four, each of them taller than I was. And every part of the vehicle looked like it was heavily armored. Good. Although I knew that against Zamnia's natives, that wouldn't necessarily be enough. Two of the non-communicative team members helped me strap myself into my seat for the journey down to the planet. There were 20 seats in the forward trailer, plus two in the cabin, presumably for the drivers. One of them had been specially modified to accommodate my suit. All the humans had suits of their own, of course. Even though the atmosphere was breathable, there was no sense in risking contaminating anything with microorganisms. As the rest of the team boarded the rover, I noticed that the four I had spoken to were wearing white suits, while the rest were wearing black. Theirs looked bulkier as well. Perhaps the researchers in white were more senior and got more sophisticated suits, although Mackenzie was wearing a black suit as well, so that didn't track. Before I had much chance to think about it, we launched, and after that, I had other stuff on my mind. This was where the difference between human and AMIA technology became apparent, because it was a much bumpier ride than I was used to. Unfortunately, the trailer had no windows, which was a shame because Zeramnia has some spectacular views. There are mountain ranges double the height of anything we have back on Homeworld. However, when I mentioned this to Dr. Reed, he showed me how to access the external cameras through my suit's uplink to the rover. The sun was just beginning to climb above the eastern massif, and stretching out below us lay a jagged shadow a thousand kilometers long and a hundred wide. It looked all too much like teeth. The rover landed with a bruising jolt, and within seconds the shuttle had detached us and started heading back into orbit. 
As planned, we had landed on a rocky outcrop that was relatively free of vegetation, although even here there were vines embedded in the cracks. Two of the black suits unstrapped themselves, and a hatch opened in the top of each trailer. There had to be turrets I hadn't seen while the rover was attached to the shuttle. Presumably they were there to act as lookouts, although why they couldn't just use cameras for that I had no idea. Perhaps they didn't have 100% confidence in human technology. I certainly didn't. The rover started moving immediately, axles grinding, throwing me around as it bumped and bounced over the rocks. Soon we were off the outcrop and down among the vegetation. Zeramnia's flora lacks woody trunks and is dominated by low-growing shrubs and vines. Instead of overshadowing competitors, they've evolved to simply smother them, often actively dragging them down and pulling out any nearby shoots with special tendrils. Once a plant establishes itself, it tends to pile up branches into a dense mound or pyramid several meters high and a similar width, with a clearance of a three or four meters around it enforced by a root system that's just as aggressive in strangling any rivals before they break the surface. Most of the planet is characterized by these shrub forests. The benefit of this was that the rover could follow the winding paths created by the gaps around the bushes, which were paved by a kind of mossy grass that survived by being too shallow-rooted for the nearby bushes to notice. It was almost a shame to watch the massive tires tear up the soft green carpet as we pushed in among the mounds of foliage. The disadvantage was that once you were in the forest, visibility on the ground was limited to a few meters. Without a canopy, the skies were clear, and I was thankful for the armored roof between myself and the swarms of flyers I knew were out there but those swarms meant that aerial recon drones tended not to last long, so there could be a huge predator on the other side of the nearest bush, and you wouldn't know it until you rounded the corner and found yourself face to face with it. Or at least you wouldn't if you didn't have a scanner provided by the AMIA Science Consortium. As part of the agreement for the joint research expedition, we'd agreed to contribute a scanner capable of detecting native organisms. Annoyingly, Zeramnian fauna tended to have a body temperature that matched the ambient environment, which was why human thermal imaging cameras were useless. However, we had the technology to detect bioelectricity, although only up to a range of about 40 meters, and only if the organism was large enough. Still, better than nothing. One of the black suits was operating the scanner, and as far as I could see, he was doing a competent job of it, so I left him to it. I could access its readouts through my suit anyway. The rover trundled along, although even at low speed on a relatively flat surface, I could feel every bump and hump that passed beneath us. We, Amia, have never gone in for wheeled vehicles. The first artificial transports we developed were gliders, and ground cars were only a curiosity invented well after we reached the industrial age. I did not enjoy experiencing the results of a whole other line of technological development, although Dr. Wei assured me that the rover had the best suspension available for a vehicle of its weight. I longed to stretch my wings and take to the air, but of course, taking my suit off and flying around would be suicide. Even in my suit, I wouldn't dare expose myself by flying above the height of the bushes, if a few bumps and bruises were the most uncomfortable thing that happened to me on this expedition. I'd count myself lucky. Our first stop would be a cave that had been identified by orbital scans. We'd tried sending a drone down to take a look last year, but before it could get close, it had been attacked by a swarm of species A0522. We hadn't got as far as giving most of Zeramnia's wildlife proper names yet. Hopefully, the heavily armored rover would be able to approach safely, and we'd get some samples and get out before anything nasty came our way. If there was anything lurking in the shrubbery, it didn't feel like attacking the large, noisy vehicle. The other problem with the shrub forests was that the piles of foliage were the perfect hiding place for smaller predators. I was confident that the scanner would pick up a swarm large enough to be a danger to us, though. Well, fairly confident. Either way, we reached the cave without any sign of danger nearby. The rover was able to get to within about a hundred meters of the mouth before the rock formations got too jagged to continue. The humans sent a drone in first, of course. It was a fairly flimsy-looking thing that only seemed to carry audio-visual recorders, but it was able to get a good look at the interior of the cave. There was plant life, which seemed to be very different to that growing outside the cave, but no immediate evidence of any animals. 
Now came the part I had been dreading. We would have to leave the rover. I kept reminding myself that we had the scanner and that we would only be going just inside the mouth of the cave and that we would head back to the rover at the first hint of trouble. It didn't really help. Still, at least I wasn't going first. I was expecting there to be some kind of discussion over the order we'd go out. There certainly would have been a spirited debate between an AMIA science team over who got the honor of walking into a highly dangerous survey area. Evidently, it had been decided beforehand, however. Six of the black suits, including team leader Mackenzie, formed up by the hatch at the back of the rear trailer, then the four white suits and myself, then five more black suits behind us. Six black suits were staying in the rover, including the two in the turrets and the two drivers. The only instruction I was given by Mackenzie was to stay in the middle of the group, which was what I'd been planning on doing anyway. She also reminded me not to activate my suit jets unless it was an absolute emergency. I was the only one with a flight-capable suit, and if I took to the air, it would be a lot more difficult for them to protect me. Not to mention not a good idea in the confined environment of the cave. I'd like to say that it was an unnecessary warning, and there was never any chance that I'd panic and fly into the roof of the cave, but that would be a lie. As we exited the rover, I made a point of toggling my jets to standby mode. The team members in the black suits were curiously synchronized. As soon as we were out of the rover, they fanned out in what looked like a predetermined pattern, creating a semicircle. This somewhat reassured me that they knew what they were doing, although their almost mechanical movements were slightly disconcerting. There were two drones overhead, but they seemed really lightweight for what was presumably our first line of defense. I couldn't see a stunner prong on any of them. Presumably they had some human equivalent, but they didn't exactly inspire confidence. The mouth of the cave was at least five meters high and festooned with stalagmites and stalactites. It looked uncomfortably like a huge mouth filled with scything fangs. As you can probably tell, my subconscious was working overtime at this point, trying to convince me that I was about to be mauled by something big and toothy. I did my best to ignore it, although the rational part of my brain didn't entirely disagree with it. Five of the black suits led the way while the rest arranged themselves in a circle around myself and the four white-suited team members. It seemed like the heavier suits must offer better protection, although this really begged the question why they weren't all wearing them. As we started picking our way through the stalagmites, I tripped and would have fallen but for one of the black suits grabbing me. I thanked him for which I got a rather terse acknowledgement, and remembering that my mission was as much to study the humans as the Zoramnians, I tried to wedge this opening into a conversation. What's your name? What's your speciality? Have you published any good papers recently? Normal academic stuff. The sort of thing that should work cross-culturally. He at least gave me his name, Velazquez. But the other questions didn't seem to really register with him, and I got the impression that the only reason he didn't tell me to shut up was because someone senior had instructed him to be polite to the alien. He seemed very focused on the cave, alert for danger. One of the other black suits had the bioscanner and the drones were just above us. But I supposed it did no harm if everyone had their eyes open too. Given that danger was the base state of existence for humans, it was probably a natural instinct. I'd brought a chemical sampler, basically a rod about a meter long that I could stick into whatever substance I found that would suck up a sample and give me a quick summary of its composition. Not a hugely sophisticated tool, all it really told you were the basic building blocks, but I could do DNA and microscope analysis back at the lab. The humans were all carrying their own equipment. I could just about recognize the sample jars, but the rest of it was a mystery to me. Most of the black suits were carrying a blocky rectangle they kept pointed at the ground. Some sort of scanner. Two of them were carrying rods that looked almost like my sampler, although with a wider nozzle, and tanks on their back which I assumed were for the collected samples. The cave was a treasure trove of indigenous life that we hadn't encountered before. There were no vines or shrubs. The vegetation in the cave looked to be related to the mossy grass that blankets the open spaces in the shrub forest, but they were putting out stalks that had little caps on them. Dr. Bauman mentioned that they looked very similar to a sessile, non-photosynthesizing earth life form called mushrooms. Several species produced a faint bioluminescence, 
and they seemed to attract fluttering little creatures no more than a gram or two in weight. We eagerly collected samples of both the mushroom-like plants and the tiny flyers. As we pushed into the cave, we noticed that there were bioluminescent lights hanging from the ceiling as well. These, however, quickly turned out not to be plants. As one of the tiny flying creatures approached, a shadow darted down and snapped it up. Closer inspection with a drone revealed that it was a small creature about 20 centimeters long that was clinging to the ceiling with eight pairs of legs. Zeramnia's most common taxonomic kingdom was comprised of species that generally had three distinct parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. The thorax always had four legs, evenly distributed in keeping with the quadrilateral symmetry displayed by the clade. But some species had two or even three or four segments for up to 16 multi-jointed legs. Viewed head-on, they were X-shaped, although often the upper legs bent down. In this case, the ambush predator had a double thorax with four lower legs for walking and four upper legs that stuck out perpendicular to anchor it. It was the long, tail-like abdomen that had a light at the tip. When a flyer approached the tail, the elongated head struck, swinging down and inflating its oral sphincter into a cup shape that closed around the tiny organism. It was all very fascinating, in a gruesome sort of way. We would have liked to take a specimen back for analysis, but the newly discovered species ZC0083 was very firmly fixed to the roof of the cave and couldn't be dislodged by nudging it with a drone. There didn't seem to be any way they could be a threat to us, so we kept going. For another few meters, that is. Then the bioscanner picked up something. It couldn't be species ZC0083, they were too small. A swarm of them might be enough to trigger the scanner, but we would be able to see their taillights. There was something else in the cave with us, and it was moving towards us. Suddenly, all the black suits were no longer pointing their devices at the ground, but ahead of them. It was only now that it occurred to me that they might be weapons. Instinctively, I looked up, searching for an escape route. There was still nothing but solid rock above me. However, I did note that all the bioluminescent lights had gone. I checked the drone feed. Species ZC0083 was still there. They had just retracted their lures into an armored sheath. Like most animals on Zeramnia, they had a thick, protective exoskeleton. Their heads were also pulled in under their thorax segments. They'd sensed a predator nearby. I saw a flash of movement behind a stalagmite about 20 meters away. As a group, we began backing up towards the mouth of the cave, careful to maintain the formation with the black suits on the outside. I caught another flicker of something darting along the wall to my right, too quick to tell how big it was. The bioscanner was still tracking it. It was 15 meters away now. We continued to head calmly towards the exit, and I could already see shafts of daylight piercing through the maw of stalactites behind us. That was when it attacked. A long, thin shadow surged along the ground roughly 10 meters to our right, then leaped. I just had time to see four enormous fangs open, then it exploded. Well, something exploded. There were explosions, very bright and very loud, even through my suit's filters, and I saw the leaping predator snatched out of the air, Icor spattering as it was ripped apart. It twitched a few more times as more chunks were ripped away from it, and I saw that the bright flashes were coming from the tips of the black suit's rectangular devices. Well, they were definitely weapons. Team leader McKenzie gave the order to cease fire, and the explosion stopped. The black suits didn't relax, however, turning their weapons to cover the rest of the cave in case anything else was lurking. Two of them advanced to check that the thing was actually dead, and by the light of their suit lamps, I got my first good look at it. About two meters long, very streamlined X-shaped mouth with a 20 centimeter long fang on each of the four mandibles. There didn't look to be any differentiation in its eight legs, indicating that it had no preferential orientation. That is, no back, belly, or flanks, equally capable of running at full speed whatever side it was on. It was also very definitely dead. Even Zeramnian wildlife can't live through having that many of its internal organs rendered external. AMIA research teams generally followed a low-impact protocol when conducting research in an alien biosphere, using non-lethal deterrence and trying to affect the local wildlife as little as possible. Evidently, humans did not share that ethos. Whatever it was that had hit the predatory creature, it was definitely very high impact. Some of the team seemed almost disappointed.
I distinctly heard the words, just a small one, uttered. I'm entirely confident that even in my suit it would have had me for lunch, but most of the humans were clearly unimpressed. However, Dr. Reed, who like me specialized in xenozoology, was very excited. ZC0084, as I provisionally labeled it, was not just a new species, but a new genus. This was the day that species ZC0084 entered the history books. Although that probably wouldn't be much consolation to the first observed specimen. One of the black suits rather unceremoniously threw the corpse over their shoulder. I could tell the armored suits had some strength augmentation. But it also occurred to me that while the now deceased predator might be a good 10 kilos heavier than me, it was probably 10 or 20 kilos lighter than most of the humans in the group. Even without their weapons and armor, the 15 humans might well have been able to keep it at bay. With their technology, it was barely even a contest. We left the cave, the corpse of the formerly apex predator dripping a trail of ichor behind us. Humans 1, Zeramnia 0.